Hi everyone and welcome to our 10th and final QI Connect session for 2018, which is actually the 50th session since we began. My name is Sandra McDougall, I'm Acting Director with the Scottish Health Council and I'll be your guest host for this afternoon's session. QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement, innovation and integration. So welcome to QI Connect. I'm now going to pass you over to Jennifer, who will tell you a little bit more about the session and about the technology. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Thanks, Sandra, and good afternoon to all of our QI connectors joining us today. So we're really excited to have you. So as always, I've just got a couple of quick housekeeping slides just to get started. Um, if you could please use the chat function that you see on the right-hand side of your screen to communicate, and I'll talk you through this in just a moment. If you are having any technical difficulties, such as not being able to hear the presenter speak, or if you keep losing connection, then please message the event manager using the chat function or by pressing star zero on your telephone keypad. So these sessions are designed to be an interactive learning experience. So we do encourage you to use the chat function to share any questions, comments or ideas throughout the talk. And there will be, as always, an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, my colleague Jess, who's sitting beside me just now, is going to be sharing hyperlinks throughout the chat function to any resources mentioned by our speaker today. But as always, it's a learning resource for all. So if you have anything you'd like to share, please do put that in the chat box for us. So we did promise that today's session was going to be fun and interactive, and this is a really interactive piece. Um, so we're delighted um, we've got so many people around the world joining us for QI Connect, but we're really keen to find out where you're joining us from. So if you could please select the annotation tool that you see circled on red here on the screen. And then if you click on the arrow icon, And then if you can get ready and select the country you're joining us from just using your arrow. So hi Fiona, hi Be Becky, hi Glenda, Caroline, David Grayson, hello. <laughs> That's fantastic. So always just give a couple of seconds. I know there's a can be a bit of a time lag um, for people, but that is fantastic. Thank you so much. We're so pleased to have you on today's session today. And hi Dave. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to now just move on just to tell you a little bit just about QI Connect and some of the organisations. So I'm so excited. So not only is this the 50th QI Connect that we've had, which is amazing, um, but we now actually have over a thousand, so 1,017 organisations which join us from QI Connect, which is just incredible. Um, so um, regular QI Connectors will know we, that we run a competition on each session and everyone gets super competitive about this because there's an amazing prize coming up. Um, so please get ready and the first person to click on the flag for Sweden. So get your anti get your arrows ready. Not quite Liz. Oh, it was so quick. I'm going to have to go to the flag watcher. Katrina Logie. Katrina Logie. An improvement advisor at Lanarkshire. Brilliant. Well done, Katrina, and congratulations. And your amazing prize of a QI Connect mug not to be seen on eBay afterwards. <laughs> we'll be heading out to you soon. So we're delighted, so I should actually go back actually there to say we're delighted to have 61 countries now joining us for QI Connect. It's absolutely incredible, so really a huge welcome to everyone who's now part of the QI Connect community that we've built up between us. So I'm just now going to skip over that and just tell you a little bit about some of the new organisations. So we're delighted that we've actually got 13 new organisations joining us today. So we have, um, I'm not going to read all of these out, but just a huge hello to Access Improvement Measures in Alberta and Canada, 
Um, we've got Digital Hospital Inc. from the USA, Guy's and St Thomas Hospitals in England, Stanford Children's Health, Two Steps Forward. Fantastic and it's so great to have you um, join our QI Connect series and it's just brilliant. So hello to all of our new connector, QI Connectors. As always, we're delighted that QI Connect reaches all NHS boards in Scotland, which is fantastic. Um, and of course, um, we're also delighted that QI Connect reaches our colleges and universities. And from one small test of change that we tried for a university here in the west of Scotland, we amazingly now have 76 colleges and universities around the world linking into QI Connect. So that's so fantastic for us. Just to flag that um, our back catalogue is available for you to watch and enjoy on our website. And if you do watch any of our recordings, please let us know and we can provide certification to you for those afterwards as well. We're delighted at QI Connect. We're still um, firm partners and friends with our colleagues in um, ISQA. Um, so there have been great supporters through their fellowship programme and we welcome that continued support and working. And we're also we're making so many friends through QI Connect. We're also delighted um, just to have our ongoing partnership um, with the Health Foundation as part of their Q um, initiative. Um, so Q is an initiative connecting people with improvement expertise across the UK, which is amazing. And from that huge network of Q and QI Connect, I'm just going to now just introduce our QI Connect team. So you've already heard from Sandra, who's our guest chair. Um, you're all familiar with Brian Robson, who's our the series chair of QI Connect, um, who's unable to make it with us today. You've probably heard too much from me as I <laughs> did. Uh, session manager, um, but I also just introduced um, Michelle DeSlici, who does a great job around um, registration. Jess Yule, who's our project officer, who keeps the show on the road with QI Connect. Carmen Forrest, who's in charge of um, as admin and certification. And Alex, who unfortunately is not able to be here either, but she, Alex is our, in charge of our Twitter analytics um, today as well. So just on that with Twitter, um, we're really keen to share the learning as widely as we can and uh, we know that many of you um, use Twitter, so if you do, if you could uh, tweet throughout the session using our hashtag HISQIConnect and if you don't follow us, then please do so. Um, our, hashtag, our account handle is HISQIConnect and we'd love to see you on there as well. So. That's all from me. I'm now actually just going to hand you back to our guest chair, um, Sandra, who is just going to introduce you to uh, well, who is going to be an Dave, who's going to be an amazing speaker today. So, Sandra, it's over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm delighted to introduce our QI Connect presenter for today, Dave de Broncart, whom some of you may know better as ePatient Dave. I came across Dave a few years ago when someone recommended his TED talk to me. In that talk, he shared with a strong dose of charm and good humour his powerful and moving experience of being diagnosed with kidney cancer and how that journey uh, led him to becoming an internationally renowned patient advocate, highlighting patients' rights issues such as the importance of patient networks, access to information and medical records, and his passionate belief that patients are one of the most underutilised resources in healthcare. Dave is the author of Let Patients Help, a patient engagement handbook, and numerous journal articles. He's also a blogger, a health policy advisor, and an international keynote speaker. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Let's see, I will get the magic green ball for projecting mm -hmm. shortly, right? Here we go. Okay. Yes, I have it. And so let's see, there we go. Is my title slide up? Yes, it is. You're good to go, Dave. <laughs> good. Uh, I will be sharing with you a bit of my background. It is extremely improbable, given my life history up until 12 years ago, that I would be having anything to say to anyone in medicine. And it wasn't my idea for me to start doing this, but when people asked 
and then kept asking for more, I was happy to give back to the profession that saved my life. And I'll, I'll just move into it now. The title here is important. I'm known as an e-patient, empowered and engaged, et cetera. But I've seen in my travels that there is this new category of super patients who were not nearly engaged in their care as I was. You'll hear a little bit of that story in a few minutes. But who, when the doctors said, there's nothing more we can do for you, they dug in deeper and literally extended science, though they were not trained as scientists or physicians. And it is my point in this talk that if this is possible, which it clearly is because it's happening, we must rethink how we design the future of care, train our young medical professionals, and so on. You'll see at the bottom left, I'm one of the co-founders of a society for participatory medicine whose emblem is a handshake. Uh, I just want to give a nod to my good friend, Helen Bevan, and as it says on her Twitter uh, banner, uh, keep your coins, I want change. That's yeah, an activist is somebody who is not satisfied with simply studying uh, the situation and then writing a report about why it's not working. We actually want change. How did I come to be here? There's a lot more about this on my website, epatientdave.com, but very briefly, I just worked in high tech, particularly graphic arts. You know, I'm a guy who loves data and automation. And then as you'll hear, in 2007, I discovered I was almost dead and recovered in less than a year, true story. In 2008, I learned about the e-patient movement and started blogging about it. And in 2009, due to another strange story, I started being asked to give speeches about it. In 2010, I started doing it full time. And then in 2011, went international with my TED Talk in the Netherlands, which now has had something like a half million views and is translated into 26 languages. It's all very improbable. And in 2012, much to my amazement, medical school, school started asking me to come give talks. And I started doing advisory work for companies. And it's now 600 events in 19 countries, over 1,000 blog posts. And I mention this because this is the background that gave me the information that left me with questions I couldn't ignore that were like an itch. And the research that I've done and the thinking I've done and analysis since then is what's leading to this talk. This is the first time this, is, this idea has ever been presented publicly. It is the thesis of this presentation that as wonderful as modern medicine has become, further progress in care and self-care are being held back by a fundamental conceptual error about what this thing called patient means and what its potential is, okay? In other words, our paradigm of patient has become obsolete, and that will necessarily hold back what we think is possible, just as surely as before Copernicus, our wrong paradigm about the solar system kept us from making accurate predictions about planetary movement. I'm sure that anybody involved in this QI WebEx is interested in improving the quality of care. This is one of the articles I published. Uh, the paradigm of patient must evolve. A false sense of limited capacity can ruin all attempts at patient involvement. Let's get into it. A very brief recap of my story for those who haven't heard it. In 2007, almost, uh, what, almost 12 years ago, uh, I had a routine shoulder x-ray which happened to disclose totally by dumb luck a shadow in my lung which turned out to be a metastasis of kidney cancer. This is a generic diagram of the disease from the website of the drug I eventually got showing tumors. And in a, I had them in all these places, totally by coincidence, I matched the poster. And I had additional ones in these additional places, including one coming out of my tongue in my mouth. And 
the best available data at the time was not very good, but it said that my median survival, half the people who had been in my condition in this study were dead in 24 weeks. And I, the relevance of this is some people will say, well, why would patients want to get involved? Why not just trust the doctors? Well, I didn't ignore the doctors, for heaven's sake. I got the best doctors I could find, but I also said, is there anything I can do to help, you know? Uh, and it's easier for people to understand sometimes, and some of the cases I'll present later on uh, are parents involved with their children, right? Or if it's your parent, an elder parent, who might be in a decline, and if there's some way you can help them survive, that's the motivation. Importantly, my primary physician, the famous Dr. Danny Sands, happened to know of an expert patient community for kidney cancer patients on a website called ACOR. They've now become a company, smartpatients.com. And from the patients on that, he actually he literally said, Dave, you're an online kind of guy. You might like to join this patient community. He referred me to the internet, which is the polar opposite of doctors who say stop Googling. Okay, and my patient peers gave me what turned out to be invaluable information. They said, find a hospital, does a lot of cases. I happen to already be at one. They said, there's no cure for this disease. These are patients not supervised by a doctor or a scientist, okay? Peer-to-peer -peer healthcare. They said, there's no cure, but this stuff called high-dose interleukin-2 sometimes works. When it does, about half the time it's permanent. They said, it usually doesn't have any effect but when it does, about half the time it's permanent. But the side effects can kill you. That's why you need a specialist hospital. Don't let them give you anything else first. Here are four doctors in your area who do it and their phone numbers. And I assert that this is useful information from the point of view of the person who has the problem. And yet to this day, this is important, to this day this information is not in the medical literature. It does not, that does not invalidate the medical literature. It says there are valid pieces of information that exist outside of where we are trained to look. All right, and that turns, to be a, turns out to be a key dynamic in how super patients have accomplished what they have. As it happens, in my case, the side effects did almost kill me. And what I had done was I had first asked the doctors, how do I deal with the side effects? And they said, that's an interesting question. Nobody has ever asked us that before. I want that to change, okay? And in fact, after I survived, using information I got from the patient community, my hospital now does have a booklet on how to cope with the side effects of this drug, this drug and other ones. To make a long story short, here is one of my tumors 50 weeks after the diagnosis, and that tumor had shrunk. They didn't have to, this immunotherapy when it works is extraordinary. I didn't have, they didn't have to cut me open, just sure, they cut me open to take out the kidney, and, uh, but they didn't have, all the rest of the tumors just shrank. So hallelujah for good medicine and extremely advanced hospitals. What really blew my mind was a, few, a couple of years into my advocacy when the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, invited me. I didn't go to them and say, I think I should publish my story. They came to me and said, we think your story should be told. So if you think this is all uh, a bunch of folly, you can go complain to the editors of the BMJ. So I submitted this, but also like Helen, I'm an activist, I want change, and I was a 60 back, I was a, a hippie back in the 60s in college, and I understand power structures, so I asked my oncologist, what would you want other doctors to know about my case? And what he said was, you were really sick, I don't know if you could have tolerated enough medicine if you hadn't been so well prepared. And he was talking about my, the research I did with other patients about surviving side effects. So once again, if you think this is all folly, go talk to Dr. McDermott at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston.
So here's the paradigm popping question. We are all taught to pay attention to the peer reviewed literature. How can it be that the most useful and relevant up to the minute information can possibly exist outside of traditional channels? And I want you to bear this in mind as we look at the other super patients in a few minutes. And the answer is knowledge is power and access to knowledge has changed forever because of the internet and social media. Now we all know there's garbage on the internet. We all have to be intelligent about that, but it is no longer true that everyone should stay off the internet. The social media diagram that I used in my TED talk, I realized information is like a nutrient in a medical crisis. It can enable a healthier response, and these social media connections are precisely analogous to capillaries. I call them information capillaries. So for a desperate patient looking to save a life, this is one of the mechanisms by which they can contribute that would have been extremely difficult a generation ago. A real problem is that physicians and even patients and health policy people who were trained a generation ago may think this is wrong, and they, they are wrong about that. We must educate each other to modernize. Uh, an essential problem is the dissemination, the speed of dissemination of new information. This is a graph from a book called The Fourth Paradigm from Microsoft Research. The y-axis is the number of years it took for new discoveries to reach practice. And the x-axis is the year of the discovery. So for instance, when the British Navy discovered that scurvy could be cured with citrus fruit uh, around 1500, it took, get this, 264 years for that information to disseminate throughout the British Empire. I assert that from the point of the view of people who are dying, this is a problem and something should be done to improve that. Now you'll see that the speed of this is improving, but we still are in a world, so here we have childbirth fever, with Semmelweis uh, in Vienna, that still took almost 50 years for the words about hand washing to spread. Uh, and even H. pylori in the 1980s, the the bacteria that causes stomach ulcers uh, took 20 years before word spread. And so my point here is that patients who do not have medical or scientific training can be a vector for the dissemination of new knowledge, bringing it to the point of need. We must not let this resource go underutilized. Here's a, for those of you with an interest in information theory, information liquidity transforms what's possible. This is liquid versus not liquid. If you spill a cup of coffee, it goes everywhere, it makes a mess, okay? Here is the not liquid form of coffee, coffee beans. If you spill this, it pretty much stays put. And this is exactly what's happened to the flow of knowledge. Uh, consider this, here's a, a metaphor I use. Not liquid is like coal in a train versus liquid is a stream running through the woods. Not liquid, the, tra the pathway is slow and predictable. Liquid is fast and unpredictable. Not liquid, it takes effort to move the stuff along the tracks. That is the traditional academic publishing process. It takes years and a lot of work to get new information delivered on this pathway where with liquid information liquidity, controlling the flow takes effort. And in not liquid, anything that arrives unexpectedly is highly suspect because this is an organized workflow where with information liquidity, unexpected arrivals are no surprise. Something new shows up in your browser, nobody is shocked by that. Well, except for the specific content sometimes, especially in my country, oh my goodness, anyway. The bottom line is knowledge truly is power, all right? Here's the definition of empowerment that the World Bank uses, increasing the capacity of people to make choices and transform those choices 
into actions and outcomes. Now, bear this in mind as we start getting into some of the super patient stories. Somebody with no power, again, as a hippie back in the 60s, I learned that when somebody says, well, there's nothing I can do, that's the expression of being powerless. If somebody says, let me see what I can do, that's being empowered. And any policies we have that increase people's capacity to take effective action are empowering. And power, policies like stop Googling are disempowering. And after all, it's perverse to keep somebody uninformed and say they don't know anything, but that's what happens. So this is just a few of the many super patients. Dana Lewis and her now her former boyfriend, now husband, Scott Librand, and the whole open artificial pancreas crowd, I call them undocumented super patients because Dana has said she doesn't want to be in my book. Uh, I think she's got something going on of her own, whether it's a book or, I don't know, perhaps it's a Hollywood movie, because what they have done is extraordinary, right? So. Here they are, I interviewed them at a diabetes conference a couple of years ago. Uh, an essential thing to realize is that a person with type 1 diabetes could die on any particular day or more likely overnight if their blood sugar crashes. And they got tired of the industry saying just a few more years and they put up this hashtag, we are not waiting. And they hacked into their devices, their continuous glucose meter, digital insulin pump, and started uploading the data to the cloud. Skeptics who don't get it about this said, what are you going to do with that? And they said, I don't know, but, you know, you guys aren't doing anything for us. And so they said, Scott is a programmer. Dana is a PR professional. She has no particular scientific training. Nor did Scott, but he saw all the complex calculations she was doing all day, every day, and he said, I bet I could automate some of that. And he wrote this algorithm whose predictions are in this blue line here. And you can see that over a period of time, he got pretty good at predicting what her blood sugar was going to be. And to make a long story short, they ended up with some code that now runs on a $35 pocket computer that connects the CGM with her insulin pump for an automated artificial pancreas. DIYPS is a do-it-yourself pancreas. Yes, they did this. People who are doing this have a better controlled blood sugar level than people who have a working pancreas. And as of a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, almost 1,000 people are doing this. They've logged more than 7 million hours doing this. This is not a product. It's open source software, sort of like build your own home radio. Well, now, here's another example. Christina Sheridan and her daughter, Kate. Kate, as a student, got a nasty case of Lyme disease. Here, she went from being a star football player in school and a, uh, and a star student to being disabled on the couch at home, they, 30 doctors over a period of years, 15 diagnoses. This brilliant young woman that the family was looking at remodeling the house because she was likely to live with them as permanently disabled, right? The mother is a PhD researcher, and this was eight, 10 years ago. When they went to a new doctor, she took this stack of paper and manually typed it into spreadsheets, uh, a half meter of spreadsheets. Her lab data, and as they, as they were typing all of this in, she, they realized she had 26 symptoms and nobody anywhere was keeping track of them, so they added that. They added that to what was being tracked in this case. They extended the practice of tracking this disease uh, so it had not just the clinical data, but patient experience data, and how she responded to each of the trials, and they ended up with all these spreadsheets creating this dashboard of Kate's total symptom load, and over a period of what this goes from 2009 to 2012, 
Uh, they eventually helped home in on something that solved the problem. And this young woman is a graduate student at Oxford now, completely recovered. And they did this not in contradiction of the doctors, but to extend what the doctors had available. And Kate says, and I say to you at the bottom of this quote, I am asking you to help us change that. Understand this would not be possible if any of that data had been withheld. Furthermore, that everything that was done there with extreme manual labor is becoming possible through automation with new things that are happening. Here's another super patient named Michael Morris. Medical background, zero. Stage four colorectal cancer with metastases to the liver and lungs. Four hospitals who are unable to coordinate information between them. He is a programmer, right? And he, this is a presentation he gave in October uh, in Washington, D.C. Patient data is siloed. There's this reactive thing where the doctors say, call me if you get sick. Here he is, he's got stage four cancer. He wants to be keeping tabs on everything. So he started using this new software capability called FIRE. You can Google it. I don't have time to go into it. But he has written software that goes to all four of those hospitals and pulls all the information together into a dashboard, combining all that information into a single view so when he goes to any of those doctors now, right, the meeting starts with him presenting his case to them because they don't have all that information. He is, has extended what's possible for them to understand his case. Uh, there is work going on in the FIRE community now. Beware, they said they can tell you don't know what you're talking about if you call it to hear. It's FIRE. There is work going on now to enable the development of a whole ecosystem of patient-driven applications. I'm certain that, that within a year there will be products doing this. And a beautiful thing about it is that in the same way that you, if you have made an Excel spreadsheet, can create your own graphs to spotlight the information you want, so can he. This is something to do with the different sorts of treatments that he's getting. Now, cognitive dissonance sets in. People go to rationalize. First they said, when I started telling my story, they said, uh, but Dave, you're a MIT graduate. You're, you have a high-tech background. Then along come other people without any college education at all. Cognitive dissonance sets in their college. So let me introduce you to Sharon Terry, who back in the 1990s, when both of her children with her husband uh, had this condition, which the doctor said could not have been genetic, they laboriously figured out the actual genetic cause. What's her scientific training? Well, she has a master's in religious studies. Her husband has no college at all. This is her TED talk. Uh, and she now actually runs the Genetic Alliance, which is not just for that one disease. And when you look into it, no, she, does, she did not go back to school and get a doctorate. Here's Doug Lindsay. He also doesn't want to be in my book because he's hoping to get a book deal of his own. After he had to drop out of college because of a disabling family condition, and he ended up, I'm not making this up, Look for his name. I'm putting their Twitter handles in there so you can look them up. He in designed a surgery, a new surgery, that his doctors used successfully to cure him. He was a college dropout because the disease was so disabling, and he's now on the speaking circuit. Then there's Kim Goodsell, one of my favorite stories, because this is the sound. Her story is the sound of a paradigm stepping on its own foot and punching itself in the face. Kim has two different diagnoses, Charcot-Marie Tooth, type 2B1, and LMNA-mediated, arrhythmogenic, I can't even pronounce it. Uh, she, although her doctor said it would be a waste of your time, she went online and taught herself enough. Professionally, she's an endurance athlete. 
right? She taught herself enough to find the diagnosis. And the beautiful thing about it is the doctor said, well, this is great. Uh, and they published a poster which was accepted for a conference with her as one of the authors. Uh, and then the conference said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't let you register, Kim, because you don't have enough credentials to understand what we talk about. And there it says on the poster, Kim Goodsell, no degree. This is the, cl the clash of civilizations. Yes, what you discovered is worthwhile, but you're not one of us. So you can, well, fortunately, the famous cardiologist, Eric Topol, is her doctor and got in touch with the conference organizers and said, don't be idiots. Obviously, she's qualified. 15-year-old super patient, Jack Andreka, invented a new pancreatic cancer test, 28 times faster than the previous one, 26,000 times cheaper. He was a high school student, never mind college, and 100 times more sensitive than the previous one. And here he was on the day when, a year later, he won the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. Uh, his professional demeanor is not yet up to the standard of meeting the queen, but well, we'll work on that later. Seven more stories in this book, The Other Side of Impossible by Susanna Meadows. Here's my, the crux of this, and I need to finish up. If all these are true, how can we justify keeping patients away from their data and telling them to stop Googling? If we want to help healthcare achieve its potential, we must figure out new workflows, policies, and practices. Sure, of course, not every patient wants to do this, but where there is an opportunity, we need to encourage it, not discourage it. I know this will take developing new ways of interacting with this kind of super patient, but that's why we're here on this WebEx, all right? We need to be leaders who teach our colleagues Something new is not just possible, but is happening, and we need to work on it. Uh, my favorite way of finishing this is to have an analogy to something that happened again when I was in college in the previous century, where we had to, men had to change what they think about women's capabilities, right? Back in 1912, this election flyer in the U.S. The, on the ballot was whether women should be allowed to vote and this flyer against it said, no, because 90% of women aren't asking for it. Now, that's the answer when people say, well, Dave, my patients aren't like that. They're not asking to be involved. That is no reason to deny the arriving future. Clearly a mental error. My favorite example is back in 1967, this woman ran the Boston Marathon. Women at that time were not allowed to register. And the organizer literally tried to physically throw her out saying, get the hell out of my race. Well, five years later, a law was passed in the U.S. that says half of school sports money must go to women. And a lot of people thought that was stupid. My school's athletic director resigned. He said, this is stupid. Girls don't even sweat. Well, with funding available, all of a sudden, a generation later, 27 years later, the U.S. women's team won the World Cup. And the law, the, the principle here is remove constraints and what's possible changes. The punchline of this is that a year and a half ago, the Boston Marathon 2017, Catherine Switzer ran again with bib number 261, and she finished the Boston Marathon at age 70. And if that guy who threw her out thought it was absurd for her to do it at age 20, think about what he would have thought. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the vision of patients today on the left side and super patients who are emerging for mass market diseases where treatments are well understood. Nobody needs super patients. But people keep talking about how with personalized medicine and disease subtypes and genomics and everything, the traditional scientific workflow is just out of capacity. We need to enable super patients. Paradigm errors lead to wrong expectations. As I said, 
My thesis is that as wonderful as modern medicine has become, and I am alive because of it today, I, because of that, I got to see my daughter get married, I got to meet my granddaughter who is preparing to take over the world, unbelievably, even in kindergarten, she's, anyway. Further progress is being held back by this conceptual error, this paradigm error, and we must improve that. We must fix the paradigm. And one reason I'm producing this book this year is because it's the 100th anniversary of Max Planck's Nobel Prize. And in, in quantum mechanics, he was a complete paradigm change. And it, in his scientific autobiography, at the end of his life, he wrote this, and I just love this. A new scientific proof does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die. And a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Those are the students I want to talk to, I want all of us to talk to, uh, because reality is reality whether we know it or not. And the reason we're here on a QI WebEx is to see the possible future and start taking action toward it. Thank you so much for your attention. And the really juicy question now is, okay, what do we do with this? So now we'll open it for discussion. Well, thank you so much, Dave. You've given us a huge amount to think about there, um, and there's certainly lots of comments and questions coming in on the chat box um, and lots of inspiring stories that you, you've shared with us. Um, I think I'll start us off with a question around health inequalities, which, which is something that um, I was hoping to ask you about, and I see that Kirsty Brightwell, who's an Associate Medical Director in Primary Care in NHS Western Isles, was also um, interested in this topic, Dave. It's about health inequalities. So, like many other countries, Scotland has got a bit of an issue with health inequalities. So we've got some significant differences in health outcomes and life expectancy that can be linked to differences in income, power and wealth and other factors like access to education, work, good quality housing, etc. So what are your thoughts, Dave, on how we can support and empower those who may be the least confident, the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged in society who may not, for example, have access to the internet to become super patients like you? Well, this is, in a, in a way, this is a completely different end of the scale of, of the, the spectrum of problems. Uh, but, you know, even when I started being involved in discussions like this back in 2009, people were concerned about, well, most people don't have mobile phones. What are we going to do about that? Uh, I firmly believe personally that the solution is to keep the, the bulk of the, keep the, the status of the entire population uh, moving forward and do everything we can to bring the same thinking. You know, even if somebody doesn't have access to the internet, we can shift our thinking to realize perhaps this person in one of the most disadvantaged villages has a valid point of view on what the goals of their treatment ought to be. The, the big paradigm shift is to change away from thinking of patients as people who couldn't possibly know anything useful and are totally dependent on distant geniuses. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll ask, I'll ask another question this time from Emma Ashman, who's a service change advisor with Scottish Health Council. So from your experience, Dave, were physicians welcoming of the empowered patients? Do you think that they are welcoming the fact that patients are becoming more empowered, more informed? Well, here again, I don't know the, the age spread of the people in the audience, but we can ask the same thing, and we could say in 1980 have asked the same thing about uh, are men welcoming empowered women? Uh, the reality is culture change takes one or more generations. Uh, I know firsthand that there are many, many forward-thinking physicians, nurses, and so on in many countries around the world. And yet I also know that in every one of those countries, 
Uh, there are people who think this is all insane crap. You know, I've had doctors say that to my face. Uh, so, but, but that's the point. So in a sense, that can be discouraging, but this is not a field where, like for instance, in mathematics, if there's a new proof for a theorem, there's not much disputing whether that's true or not. This is people's beliefs about sociological beliefs about appropriate behavior. And it takes time for people to bend their minds into this new way of thinking. Do not be discouraged by the fact that even though you have, this is not like university where supposedly if you lay out a, 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 a well-documented case for action, you'll get top marks. Uh, we're talking about convincing people, some of whom may have a whole different view of the world. Stay committed to what you now know is possible. Share it with others, point it out where it's missing. I hope that answer is useful, but I imagine, you know, by Helen Bevan, I imagine would say similar things. Thanks, Dave. Um, another question for you from Karen Bell, who's Head of Research and Development at Ayrshire and Arran. Is there one thing that you would change today that you think would make a difference and what would it be? So if you could choose one thing uh, that you could change to make a difference, Dave, what would it be? Uh, well, it would have to vary, but truly, I know the answer to the question was if I could change one thing. Uh, you know, for many people, people who want to do what Michael Morris and Dana Lewis and so on are doing, are held back by lack of access to the to health data. So if you live in a place where health data is not freely available, uh, that solving that uh, can be really useful. There's a real problem for that, at least in the US, which is that there are some hospital executives who have explicitly said they don't want to do that because they don't want the patient to take their business somewhere else. Yes, the hospital executive putting their private commercial interest ahead of the patient's best interest. But on the other hand, if I were to, if I were told if, that I, I'm going to die in a couple of weeks and there is one, I can wave a wand and leave one gift for the future of humanity, it would be to cause this point of view to be installed permanently in all medical education going forward. Because a generation from now, people who are trained, exactly as Max Planck said, okay? Charles Darwin said something similar near the end of The Origin of Species. I do not expect uh, my views to be accepted uh, by uh, naturalists who have had a successful career with their view, but I have hope for the young. There you have sort of a most leading edge today and most far out answer to the one, what's the one thing I, I could change. Thanks for that, Dave. Um, got some comments from, from people as well um, as questions. So um, some comments from Steve Gilbert, who's a staff uh, specialist in anaesthetics and pain medicine in Townsville, Australia, uh, who says we should always be asking um, the patient about their goals. Uh, we need to be open to patient opinions uh, and ask, is there anything that I could have done that would have made things better for you? Uh, so a number of people making comments there, Dave, and we'll, we'll share these with you if we don't get the chance to, to go through them before the end um, of the session. Um, so another question from Jennifer Foote, who's a community nurse at NHS Highland. How do you get doctors to see and listen to the patient data and information? So this is challenging because, again, it can be a cultural issue. Uh, something that truly saddens me is, and I've had face-to-face -face conversations after a speech uh, with physicians, uh, the most difficult talk I ever gave was in Jerusalem at a meeting of the Israel Inter Internet Society with 
Israeli doctors and lawyers debating the ethics of using the Internet when the information that's on the Internet is not well controlled. Uh, I've, I've had doctors express to me that they were trained that their sacred value as a person, their choice to use their intellect for this profession, is because they know things that patients don't. And if all of a sudden patients can know things they don't, uh, that, that strikes them as a real existential challenge, and I have empathy for that. What I hope people can see is that there is a bundle of things that are doctor uh, a, a generation ago. There was what's wrong with me, the diagnosis problem. There's what are the, what's the range of treatment options. Uh, there's how am I doing, what's my status, and some of those, what I said to the Israeli doctors, uh, the schedule had run long and I was, I was the last thing between them and dinner. I said, any doctor whose sense of self-worth depends on knowing everything is in big trouble these days. I mean, today there are more than 2,000 journal articles published every day. But I said, and I said, it's no insult if a less trained person has seen a paper that you haven't, or in my case, you know, found some information about tolerating side effects that's not in the literature. But I said, there's still no substitute for the trained mind with the decades of clinical experience to put all that information in perspective. You know, so we're seeing what are the things that constitute doctor and how some of those are evolving, but you know, as empowered as I may be, the last thing I'm going to do is stop going to the doctor. I, is that a useful answer? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks very much, um, Dave. Uh, probably got time for uh, a few more questions, uh, although we're uh, just um, taking a, And I want, to, and I want to say I will I will stay on if you leave the WebEx open and answer what questions I can afterwards. Thanks, Dave. Um, so if we can just go on maybe to the next question. We've got one um, which I think is a great question from Katrina Logie, who's an improvement advisor at NHS Lanarkshire. And she's asking, how do you encourage patients to become super patients or empowered patients when they hold the belief that doctor knows best? So how would you encourage uh, patients who might be resistant to that idea uh, to take uh, more ownership of their care? So this is a really important question because uh, um, I might think that somebody should do something, but when you really get down to it, at the root of all of this is patient autonomy and self-direction, self-determination versus somebody else saying paternally, I know what you should do, you don't, I know. If I put myself in the position of saying, I know what you should do, you should be a super patient, that actually is me being paternalistic. And I, believe me, I've thought about this a lot. The appropriate thing to do, in my opinion, is to let people know, especially if they're saying, I wish there was something I could do, let them know what's available and let them know that it's a valid thing to do these days so they can choose to take action or not. But quite honestly, you know, for my car, I, I really am not interested in knowing what my mechanic knows about the inside of my car. Now, if my life depended on it for some reason, I might change my mind. Uh, I don't know that Christina Sheridan, for instance, was particularly super engaged in healthcare until her daughter was permanently disabled, and then she got involved. What I do want, I, I have a vision of a world where every hospital and doctor's office has posters on the wall that in the same way that they say, things about hand washing and getting a flu vaccine and so on, that they also encourage people to get involved with their care if they want to. You know, my doctor, they should, every hospital, 
every doctor's office should have somebody who can help people become a better Googler if they want to. You know, I mean, one thing that holds people back is not knowing whether they'll stumble onto junk. Uh, and so encouraging and enabling engagement is very different from telling somebody you should do this. Thanks, Dave. Um, absolutely, um, I have to say I, I agree with, with everything that you've, you've said there. Um, I think there's a, a kind of matter of choice for people as to how much they want to get engaged, but um, people can only exercise their, their rights to get involved if they know that those rights exist. So, you know, your point about making that information um, available in places where patients are uh, and making sure that there's people that, they are, that are there that can maybe support them to navigate information, I think, is really, uh, really key. Um, I think probably final question, which is uh, from Kirsty Brightwell, who's an Associate Medical Director in Primary Care at NHS <laughs> Western Isles. Can empowered and connected people help with publication bias? Ah, well, yes. <laughs> the, uh, this is where, for instance, in my kidney cancer community on smartpatients.com, you will see patients talking about studies that are in process that are nowhere near being in the literature. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, sharing information about studies that never do get published. Now, there is a whole separate, we could have a whole separate session, and perhaps you have on QI Connect, about the problems with what's in the literature. I'm sure this group is aware, and this is exquisitely ironic to people who become really educated about the problems of reliable information. People say, stay off the internet, the, the information on there might be crap. Well, you know, the, the editor of The Lancet in 2015, Richard Horton, said, uh, I think his wording was something about perhaps half of the information that's in the peer-reviewed literature is bad quality, it's just bad science. It's beset with small effect sizes and uh, having never been replicated by another lab and so on. It's just weak science. And what's really ironic is when a highly trained physician or equivalent has been taught that by paying attention to the literature they know better than the public, and if they are wrong and can't tolerate the thought that they might be wrong, they have been trapped by their own cultural paradigm into essentially being intellectually doomed. And we just don't need to do that. If everyone can be, can open their minds to rethink, how do we know that something that's in the atmosphere, how do we know whether it's good, reliable information or not? You know, peer review is much better than nothing, but it is not a guarantee. And in my case, the information, is, one of my favorite sayings is reality is what it is, whether we know it or not. And the whole purpose of the pursuit of science is to get better and better so that even while there's lots of uncertainty and shaky pudding, we have an increasing and ever increasing body of things you really can count on. To be honest, I'm not sure if I ever got around got back around to the original question. Oh, if I didn't, just ask again. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, we've just approached the end of the hour, so we have run out of, of time. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to, to you, Dave, uh, for your input. Um, lots of comments, lots of positive feedback. Uh, from participants throughout this, this session as well. So um, huge thank you to you for that, and we'll pass on to you um, the, the comments and any questions that we didn't manage to get to. 
Um, and just as we finish up, I'm going to just hand over to Jennifer, who's going to say a few final words. Okay, and I'll speak really quickly because I know we're just one minute past the hour. So just a big reminder again, so where are you if you're not in Glasgow between the 27th and 29th of March 2019 for the biggest and best International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare? So all the other ones have been practice runs for this one. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So be there. Um, I was going to say be square, but I wouldn't <laughs> go that far. <laughs> um, and also, so we did prompt on Twitter, we have got some really, really big news for you. So many of you have said that you would really welcome having QI Connect um, as a podcast so that you can listen to it on the go, whether it be in your car or if you're out running or whatever. So we're actually going to be testing, launching six QI Connect previous recordings um, or as uh, podcasts, and we'll send you out the details of those um, and let you know. So we're hoping before Christmas or early in 2019, so keep an eye out for that. And also, so if you've not missed us saying this at the beginning, so this is our 50th session of QI Connect. So as a celebration, we're going to be launching an e-book. Um, and it's going to be entitled, If I Could Tell You Just One Thing, and it will include quotes from um, all of our previous 50 speakers from QI Connect, just as some advice for people who are on the quality improvement journey, just to keep going and give you some motivation. So again, that will be coming your way soon. Um, so finally, it's just to say a big, huge thank you to Dave and to all the team here in the studio and for everyone that's watching. Um, if you can, please follow us on Twitter using our hashtag HISQI Connect to stay up to date, or please feel free to drop us an email at any time. We'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much again, and we'll see you in 2019. Thanks.